I would like to warmly welcome you to Moderna Museet Malmö and to the third seminar that we organize as part of Sensing Nature from Within. And we have chosen to call today's seminar Listen to the Trees and Talk with the Flowers. I think something fell. My name is Joa Jungberg and I'm the curator behind this project which uh, comprises an art exhibition with 12 artists and artist groups from different parts of the world, but also an extensive program of lectures, discussions and performances. And this uh, afternoon we will have two very interesting presentations. First out we have Christine Ödlund, there are you, uh, who participates in Sensing Nature from Within just in outside in the turbine hall with her installation Electroacoustic Aspects of Human and Plant. And it's an, a quite large installation with paintings, sculptures, videos and also living plants and you will speak more about that later on. Christine Ödlund is an artist that for a long time has been interested in non-human perception and communication and that in her work has made repeated attempts to cross language barriers between human and plant. And I think that we might get to hear a bit more about these attempts later on and maybe also a little bit why this urge to communicate with plants. In this short introduction, I would also like to mention uh, what I think is an interesting fact, namely that Christine Ödlund's artistic practice takes place somewhere in between science, metaphysics, electroacoustic music, philosophy and esotericism. And if I am not wrong, Christine, you have sometimes mentioned that you think that art can offer important tools for experimenting in these borderlands bringing diverse systems of knowledge and ideas together and exploring that which might appear in the in-between cracks. Directly after Christine Ödlund, is this uh, a little bit unstable? It's working. Right. Huh? We will have uh, a also a very interesting presentation by Eva-Marie Lindahl, sitting there. Eva-Marie Lindahl's practice is, similar to Christine Ödlund's, situated at the intersection of the human and the more than human. But whilst Christine has mainly directed her focus towards trees and plants, Eva-Marie has on her side focused more on animals, or rather on how human belief systems have given shape to strictly hierarchical and abusive relationships between humans and other animals. Important to mention is that Eva-Marie Lindahl is both a Malmö-based visual artist but also a researcher within critical animal studies at Edge Hill University in Britain. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> it, is it very bad? Do I need to change? No, it's good. Um, and when we met in your studio not so long ago, uh, you mentioned, Eva-Marie, that your work takes form along the crossroads of art, critical animal studies and activism, and that through your practice you want to inspire a radical change in how we perceive other animals. And I presume that that also um, somehow uh, means that you, in a more broader way, wants to challenge that m the mindset that places us humans above nature, that understands nature primarily as a resource, as something to control, tame and exploit. And finally, I would also like to welcome Diego Galafassi here, who will be moderating a talk after these two presentations. And at this talk, you or we in the audience also have the possibility to ask questions and uh, maybe also voice our reflections and thoughts, is that right? Yeah. Diego Galafasi is an artist and also a sustainability researcher at Lund University. In his different practices, he has looked at ways in which imagination and creativity can inspire inner transformation 
an inner transformation necessary to change our societies towards sustainability. And you're also involved in the research project Art for SDG, which examines the role of art-based methods for reaching the UN's sustainable development goals. And Son Diego will share with us his entry to the themes of today's seminar. But before that, I would like to thank Lund University and the Agenda 2030 Graduate School, with whom we have developed this amazing program for sensing nature from within. And many thanks also to our program producer, Linnea Jan, and to Re Region Skåne, uh, who has helped us with an extra financial support to make this happen. So welcome all of you and a special welcome to our three participants in today's seminar. <laughs> Thank you, Yo, and, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. It's really incredible to see uh, a full house. And because I, I believe this is a really, really critical conversation to have. So I would like to thank Yo and everyone here for organizing the exhibition outside, which is really exciting, Sensing Nature from Within, and this series of, of talks that are happening here, which, as I said, it's a really critical space and so exciting to see the arts and art institutions really leading the way because in a way uh, climate change or whatever major challenges that we're facing globally we could look at its essence and realize that it's actually a problem of relationship it's how we relate to the rest of the living world how do we place ourselves in that living world and how do we relate to the changes that are happening and I think it, it, this is where these kind of conversations can play a huge role in helping us to reassess our relationship to the rest of the living world. And today, we're going to have two really wonderful um, presentations here uh, based on the practice of these two fabulous artists that uh, came uh, to tell us more about their work. And the way it's going to work is that I'm um, they're going to have the presentation and afterwards I'm going to follow up with some questions and some conversations and finally open up for everybody to, to participate. So with that I just would like to welcome Christine for the first presentation and uh, thanks everyone again for being here with us. <coughs> uh, yes. Um I have a background in visual arts and uh, uh, electroacoustic music composition. Uh, and I have a big interest in natural science. And uh, to be able to combine these uh, worlds, uh, I'm using different artistic techniques and uh, strategies. This is important since I'm an artist and I'm not a scientist. And I have no interest in, in, and I'm not trying to, to illustrate uh, science. Um, I'm trying to work and think with a different kind of mindset. Uh, one of these uh, techniques uh, is synesthesia, uh, which I find perfect as a, as a tool to explore invisible or complex processes and, and patterns in, in nature. It could be chemical communication or frequencies in the formation of molecules or, or something like that. Synesthesia is a, is a neurological uh, condition uh, where the senses are cross-connected. Um, uh, experienced sensation in one sense is uh, responding to stimulus in another. Uh, sound can be connected to color and sent with a specific uh, shape uh, for example, and we use it in daily language. Uh, for example, uh, I, I say a dark voice or warm colors. And in art, we have uh, uh, painters like uh, Kandinsky, whose uh, abstract paintings were his experience of, of seeing music in color, line and form. Uh, other notable synesthetes uh, or suspected ones include uh, the Russian author uh, Nabokov and composers like uh, Olivier Messiaen, 
Alexander Skriabin, he, um, he made this, uh, composed this uh, symphony called uh, Prometheus, the poem of fire in 1915, uh, where he used a lot of uh, color organs. Um, Isaac Newton proposed that musical tones and color tones are shared, uh, have shared the same uh, frequencies. And uh, so did uh, Goethe in his uh, book, uh, Theory of Colors. Uh, also, the theosophy, uh, theo uh, theosophist uh, Anne Besant um, could um, uh, clairvoyantly see music materialize into form, a color, and, and motion. Yeah, so, so in my work I'm using different uh, techniques and, and materials and I'm exploring the subject uh, uh, um, I'm working with through uh, different senses and, and I'm trying uh, different perspectives. Uh, and, and I find the borderline between science and metaphysics uh, and popular culture and new age and, and theosophy uh, uh, interesting. They are fragments in a complex puzzle of, of parts in a spectrum of interrelated phenomena. Uh, and um, doing so, I'm, I'm, the outcome can be anything. Uh, it could be sound or I can do painting or, or sculpture. So, uh, I've been interested for a long time in, in plants um, and their communication. Uh, for many years I've been uh, following the, the research on how plants communicate chemically, uh, but also acoustically. Uh, I've been uh, uh, collaborating with researchers at uh, uh, an ecological chemistry research group led by uh, Professor Anna Karinborg Karlsson at the Royal Institute of Technology in, in Stockholm uh, since 2007. And uh, the starting point of this collaboration uh, was a show uh, with the title Changing Matters, the Resilience Exhibition at the Natural History Museum in Stockholm 2008. And um, this exhibition was focusing on the different systems sustainability on breaking points and, and power of resistance. And here I decided to, to look deeper into the chemical language of plants. Uh, and uh, just before I, I go into what, uh, what I have sh uh, here, um, the, the image, the drawing I have, uh, I will just say some words about um, uh, this field of, of re research, uh, plant communication, uh, and our understanding of plant life. Uh, this, this is something that has changed uh, and developed uh, during the last couple of, of decades. Uh, and the interest has uh, increased. Uh, and the reason for this has many answers, but one of them is, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the plant's uh, uh, survival strategies. We are in an acute situation because of the climate change. And since plants have been around for about 400 million years or something like that, we uh, humans have uh, possibly uh, something to learn from, from them and their resilience. And uh, due to their uh, survival strategies and their capacity to orient themselves using an array of different senses uh, and their awareness of their surroundings, uh, some researchers uh, even uh, say or, or propose that plants should uh, be considered equal to animals. And this is something that uh, we or at least some of us uh, have uh, sensed since forever. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, and this, this increased uh, interest in, in research around plant life uh, does not only happen in science, it uh, of course reflects in popular culture. For example, uh, maybe you know this book of uh, Peter Wolleben, the German forester who uh, has uh, written the book uh, The Hidden Life of Trees. Uh, 
that is one example that I find interesting. The book uh, has uh, infuriated scientists while being warmly welcomed by lay people. Uh, the critique argues that uh, his oversimplified and emotional writing will help neither the environment in general nor forests in particular. Um, I find uh, Volleven's uh, approach complicated because of his anthropomor anthropomorphic view of nature, especially trees. Uh, but the popularity in this book, I think, is uh, one of many signs and uh, effects that uh, exist uh, at the border uh, between new age and science. And, and, and uh, what I find interesting is that this border is uh, moving uh, and accelerating towards uh, science and hard facts. Um, and uh, yeah, as an artist, I find these uh, borderlines uh, very inspiring. And, uh, and this borderline between science and metaphysics um, uh, is truly uh, inspiring. However, the most uh, uh, interesting part of this is uh, the consequences this might have in the future. Uh, yeah. Um, So, um, there's a complex and sophisticated form of chemical language uh, for the purpose of communicating with other plants and insects uh, among plants. And uh, at best, humans apprehend these chemical messages as smell or scent. I wanted to immerse myself in the subject where and thereby create a work in which I could combine my interest in natural science uh, with music. And my questions were, what sort of temporality can plants' chemical communication be said to have? And what does a plant dialogue actually look like? Does the answer come the same day as the question is asked? Uh, I also speculated where this chem chemical language could be uh, deciphered in full someday, and how uh, we then could be able to bridge the language barrier between humans and plants. Can humans have a dialogue with non-human organisms? I think so. I will show you a piece called A Stress Call of the Stinging Nettle. Uh, but before I do that, I want to uh, uh, show you this little fiber. This is an experiment uh, with a kale plant. Uh, this little fiber you see there is picking up uh, uh, chemical uh, compounds that the plant is emitting. And then uh, later on, is, uh, this fiber is uh, analyzed. And we can move to the other. Here you see. This is my uh, drawings of this situation, this experiment situation, and, and there's the little fiber. So we can move on. And I've been uh, working with um, uh, this ecological chemistry uh, group for some years. And here's the lab uh, where uh, there is both uh, butterflies and uh, stinging nettles. And uh, next uh, image is a piece called uh, The Stress Call of the Stinging Nettle. And it's from 2010. Uh, I started this in 2007. And uh, here uh, uh, I describe a chemical reaction where a stinging nettle is attacked by the larvae of uh, a comma butterfly. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Anna Karnborg Karlsson, who were overseeing this ecological chemistry group, she very generously uh, gave me access to research data. Uh, in the experiments, plants and larvae are placed in a bell jar, as I showed you, in order to capture the chemical substances uh, emitted by the stressed stinging nettle and when the larvae is eating from, from its leaves. Um, and um, 
I compiled uh, measurements uh, taken at uh, different times during the attack, and I constructed this score uh, and placed all of the data along a timeline in which a day in reality is equivalent to a minute in music. I smelled an, uh, a concentrated form of every individual substance that the plant emitted and uh, gave every substance a scent description and a corresponding color and an acoustic profile. So, uh, I don't know if it actually see, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, one of these substances, stress substances, is EE of Farnesene, uh, that smells like apple, was assigned the color red. Uh, methyl salicylate, I say it in Swedish, uh, which smells like jenka gum or root beer, uh, received the color blue. And two substances that smell uh, in varying strengths of grass, uh, Z3-hexanyl acetate and uh, Z3-hexanol, were colored light and dark green. And I was interested in the time frame of reactions. Uh, uh, and it, um, what I uh, could see was that it took uh, about a day uh, before the plant reacted to the attack and another 24 hours before uh, the stress signals had reached their full strength. Uh, the level then remained unchanged until the attack was over, and the uh, surrounding nettles react to these uh, stress signals by ceasing all above growth and directing their energy instead to the underground root system until the danger is over. I have a little movie uh, that we can show just a short bit. Uh, it's in this um, uh, point PowerPoint. It's the next. There. Yeah. S in some way, if you press somewhere, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. No. No, it's not that one. <laughs> it was the one uh, you had. I think you just press uh, in somewhere in the middle uh, on the screen, or maybe space. Space. Should we? That one, maybe. Yeah. And it's supposed to sound, but uh, ah. Anyway, the idea is that uh, yeah, you can hear the different substances. Uh, and this is a way, in the beginning you can hear healthy nettles, and then you, uh, you hear the stress call. Well, some little thing is missing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, this this uh, score has been interpreted by many musicians, so yeah, this is my yeah. Here's uh, full full stress. <laughs> There's some extra sound. <laughs> The computer wants to be in this. Oh. That's not bad either. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um.
this is uh, one way of just uh, uh, understanding what is happening uh, over time. Uh, since this is uh, smell and sense that uh, we humans can't uh, uh, smell, um, I uh, transposed it to sound instead, and just to have an idea of uh, how they how they communicate, what kind of timeline we are talking about, and. Um, uh, also, in, in this uh, lab, uh, which you see in the next image, uh, I made um, a piece called Bl Plant Drummer. And um, uh, here's a, a butterfly called Yellow Admiral. And um, uh, like the comma butterfly, it uses its front legs like uh, drumsticks. Uh, during a certain period, at a certain time of day, the females drum on the leaves uh, uh, of the plants. In this case, it was uh, stinging nettles. And in this case, it's an artificial stinging nettle. Uh, uh, the theory is that uh, this behavior is uh, aimed at either uh, forcing out scents uh, or pricking holes in the leaves surface to uh, proc procure uh, chemical information um, uh, about the host plant before uh, the butterfly lays her eggs. Uh, in the filmed material, I uh, found uh, differences between a few drumming styles and rhythmic patterns and I was speculating whether the drumming could be acoustic communication with other butterflies, perhaps, or with the plant itself, as um, the drum rhythms uh, would hypnotize the plant into revealing its innermost chemical secrets. And I have um, a movie. Um, that shows this plant drumming. Yes, and uh, this uh, goes on for about uh, two hours, and uh, then I had to wait to the next day. Around two o'clock, they began uh, drumming. Uh, and. Um, here, uh, lastly, I will talk about the installation here at the Moderna Museet in Malmö. And this installation is uh, partly inspired by uh, bioacoustic research at the University of Western uh, Australia, 
where Monica Galliano have done experiments uh, with corn plants. Uh, the result shown uh, that the plants can give off high-pitched uh, high pitched clicking sound through the ends of their root tips and that the roots move towards the sounds of certain frequencies. And my hope is that the plants in this installation uh, respond to the same frequencies. I play clicking sound to, with frequencies around uh, between 200 and 300 hertz uh, through speakers turned towards the roots of, uh, of my philodendron in that left uh, box. And uh, in the other glass box, I have uh, contact microphones on the plant roots of some monsteras. And uh, my acoustic, and, and, and uh, my acoustic, I would like, or any uh, acoustic reaction would sound through a connected um, uh, speakers. Uh, and um, before I uh, uh, talk more about that, I think I will explain some more uh, of the details in this installation. Uh, maybe the the the, the uh, paintings, maybe. See here, yeah, that painting. Um, yes, this uh, painting is. Uh, uh, shows the chemical symbol of uh, the chlorophyll molecule. And um, besides acrylics, I've used pigments of stinging nettle, uh, which gives the, the green tones, and the black is indigo. And the next painting is uh, supposed to be green. Oh, maybe it is. Um, uh, these are all called uh, electroacoustic aspects of plant and man. And in this abstract uh, painting, I have used uh, acrylics, pencil, and plant pigments of stinging nettle, indigo, and thyme. And in this plant study, I paint with the same substance that I examine. And that, for me, is a form of non-formal hyperrealism. And um, the diagrammatic pattern I'm using uh, is uh, for me to be able to use the painting as a musical score uh, with the uh, timeline and, and pitch. And the last uh, painting is a big one. Um, uh, here I also used the, the grid to describe a musical process and I'm comparing plants with humans. Uh, chlorophyll uh, is compared to hemoglobin, the red substance in blood. Chlorophyll is the pigment with the photosynthesis that produce food for the plant. Um, and um, even if chlorophyll and blood uh, exist in two very different organisms, their structures have similarities. And these uh, are made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. But uh, the core consists of iron in blood and magnesium in chlorophyll. Uh, Plant um, and man are both eukaryotes and are uh, and relate uh, through geometry and mathematics through the golden ratio and the Fibonacci uh, sequence. The spiral is found in all matter. Uh, in the upper right corner, there's a diagram with electrical oscillations from a brain uh, and. Uh, and from, from a brain and from a plant. And uh, concluding that uh, we are uh, electrical organisms. Uh, the outer form has the contour of a human brain. And then we have the, the uh, maybe the, the movie with the, the electrical one, Plant Man Electro. Uh, Nikola Tesla uh, was a Serbian inventor and he developed an, uh, the, the alternating current, among other things. And he had some interesting ideas about how to decode uh, electrical brain waves. Uh, many of his inventions uh, wasn't realized because of uh, lack of funding, but um, um, uh, yes, he had some, some of these. Uh, um, 
ideas uh, that I find very inspiring how to to uh, connect with through through electricity uh, and here in this uh, piece my uh, my ambition to to bridge the language barrier between plants and, and humans uh, could be uh, a way uh, in this video I use a Tesla swear and uh, living nettles that I have in my or had in my studio and by pressing the leaves with my fingertips against the sphere, electrical flashes are produ produced and the plants and I are in the same electrical, electrical circuit or loop. Yeah, we can see some of the, you, you see it here in the exhibition. Uh, and uh, in the end of, uh, of the movie, uh, there is a sequence with the Kirillian photography uh, uh, where I have used a uh, nettle, a monstera and a philodendron. And um, the inventor of that technique is Simeon Kirillian in 1939. And uh, he thought that uh, this image uh, could reveal information uh, of the inner aura of the, the object analyzed. And many experiments have been conducted with these ideas in, in uh, psychology and para, parapsychology, mostly in the 70s. Uh, today, the technique is used in aura photography. Um, I don't know if it's possible to walk forward to the, the little bit. Ah, here it is, yeah. There, it's the Kirlian photography. A little bit forward. Yeah, there. Here's the nettle. Uh, this, this image was uh, done in my, um, in a friend's father's sauna. He built up this lot of gear, electrical gear, to make these images. Now I think it's uh, a little dark. Yeah. So, um, I will uh, uh, stop here, but I would like to ask, uh, well, this is what I'm thinking about. Uh, what is intelligence? And, and uh, I mean, um, the plants, uh, they, they, uh, they can communicate with this sophisticated uh, uh, language, they can, they can hear, they can uh, uh, communicate acoustically, uh, they, uh, they have a memory, uh, they can do risk analysis, they can plan, they can, uh, they use more senses than, than humans do and um, they are helping each other in, in stress situations. Um, I think it's another kind of intelligence, but uh, and I, I think that we soon will be uh, able to communicate with with plants or this kind of life forms with non-human uh, languages, and um, we have uh, scientists like uh, Stefano Mancuso, a professor in, in uh, at the University in Florence, that um, uh, is uh, he has the Institute of uh, plant neurobiology uh, says a lot and um, here in, in this uh, installation uh, let's say that uh, the, the roots uh, will uh, respond with the clicking sound uh, that would actually uh, change everything and uh, the world wouldn't be the same uh, if I would get this answer and um, it was would be as fantastic as as uh, being contacted by an alien from another planet, uh, but uh, I think it's not we're not far from from there that moment. Thank you.
Thank you, Christine, for this wonderful presentation. I've, I'm just going to follow up with one quick question, if that's OK, before we turn to, to Eve Marie. I find it really fascinating how you, you use your practice not only as a way to like, represent what is being communicated, but actually to enter into a conversation with this. So you use notation not as a, as a plot to represent what is being said, but actually as a way for you to listen into what is being said. I find that really fascinating. And we'll dig into more in our conversation. I just had one quick follow-up, because you use a lot of, of nettles. And I'm just wondering, what is, what is why it? is that? Why is that? Yeah. I find them uh, really fascinating. They're, they have character. They have character, absolutely. And they can, they, they can, uh, I, I had a show um, in a gallery where I had, uh, uh, it, f it was filled with uh, living nettles. Mm -hmm. And they so, they, they talk so clearly about uh -huh. how, how they feel. It's sometimes it's really, the uh, scent is really green and uh, chlorophyll is fresh. And when they are not happy, <laughs> something else is more animal-like, yeah. really. Yeah, they spoke to you somehow. <laughs> Great. So thanks again, Christine, and uh, uh, please welcome also uh, now to the next presentation, Eve Marie. And so my name is Eva Marie Lindahl. I am an artist, and I'm based here in Malmo. Uh, but as you also said, uh, I'm also doing research. Uh, I'm a PhD student or doctoral student at a university named Edge Hill University outside of Liverpool. Mm, I mostly work with drawing text and now lately, the latest years, I've done some performance. Uh, and they have taken the shape of guided tours at museums, which I will show you a bit later. And I'm interested in my practice in correcting the anthropocentric, that means human-centered, and patriarchal history that seems to be the foundation of art history. And I want to correct this kind of history with writing and performing other histories in plural than the ones usually told and taught. And uh, through this presentation today, I will uh, try to introduce some of the key concepts that, concepts that I work with and that informs my artistic practice and the research that I do. And after this then, I will do a short kind of performance reading uh, slash virtual guided tour. Uh, so we will actually end this present, or I will actually end this presentation by taking you to Stockholm and Nationalmuseet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my PhD project is named Reframing the Non-Human Animal in Art Production. And it's based in artistic research. And it's rooted within the academic field called Critical Animal Studies. And let me explain what this means. Artistic research means that I develop knowledge and new ways through my own artistic practice and that I actually believe that art is a place that can create new knowledge and ways in the world that we can create change. And that these new ways of thinking and acting can be shaped. Um, critical animal studies is an interdisciplinary academic field that is dedicated to the ending of animal and ecological exploitation. So it wants to end the oppression and domination of non-human animals, in short. This means that it is a field that critically explores the ways humans interact and relate to other animals, as well as how different forms of oppression towards human and non-humans are all interlinked, never can be set apart, and have, their s have and use the same ways and systems. It also means that I have an agenda. Mm -hmm. I want you to question the relationship you have with other animals, 
and the way you use non-human animals as resources in your lives. I want artists especially to stop using the bodies of other animals in their art production. And I want artists to start asking the question, where is the origin of their pigments and their glues and all their materials in the studios? So the question I want artists to start, start asking, and basically all of us, is has anyone suffered for this material? Has anyone suffered for this food in front of me? Is this based on a one's living and breathing body? Um, so this research project that I'm doing, it's uh, divided into two different chapters. Uh, the first is focusing on physical uh, representation of non-human animals in oil paintings uh, that I see and experience when I visit museums and do my research. And there I experiment with resizing the painting into the natural size of the portrayed animal by large-scale and hand-drawn and very time-consuming graphite drawings. I usually make one drawing a year. This is one. Mm. The second chapter that I'm working on at the moment and which I will be focusing more on today with you here uh, is a process of rewriting art history from the perspective of the non-human animals that are portrayed within these paintings that I study. Something that could perhaps be called art history activism, since I want to challenge this human-centered system of art history writing uh, and try to imagine another one or plural histories when non-human animals are in the center of stories. So therefore my work should be seen as a practice that also is a longing for radical change of how animals are used and perceived within the system of art that I belong to. Uh, and it is, of course, from this platform of longing for change that I'm speaking from today. Um, so how can these multi-species arts histories then be imagined and also told? And first, why are these histories, histories even important? because I believe that we need to be kinder. We need to be kinder to the world, no matter which species. And to be able to be kinder and imagine these new realities that we need to create for ourselves, we need to get creative. We need to questions, question our norms, our hierarchical norms, uh, and we need to start imagining. We need to question the order of the world, often telling us one singular history when there are in fact several, with written from different perspectives with different agendas. Mm. So we are very used to seeing animals depicted like this throughout the history of painting from the beginning of humankind to today. And they are mostly present, for example, in these paintings here to tell the story of one or several humans. Horses fight our wars. Lions are placed in the center of menagerie paintings that boasts of a fictional collection of a king or a rich man. Dogs sit on the lap of their queen. And even though these non-human animals are visually present within art constantly, all the time, um, they are never really allowed to be individuals with their own agency, with their own histories. So this is what I'm trying to investigate. What happens to a reading of a specific painting if we refuse to read the animals portrayed symbolically? If we recognize the individual that somewhere and sometime was studied and perhaps killed and later painted or perhaps first killed 
and then painted. If we instead choose to see that individual as a person with relationships, histories, and agency, does that shift open up for a reading that entails a before and after? Does that make the death and oppression towards other animals more visible? Since being part of art production often is a really violent and deadly affair to those who are not human. How can these multi-species art histories be imagined told? Uh, I believe that the key is anthropomorphism that you also touched upon. Mm, and empathy, and the courage to imagine. Um, and to start accepting the overwhelming evidence to the fact that we as humans are not the only ones with consciousness and the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. In short, anthropomorphism means ascribing human emotions to those who are not human. But it could also be seen as a method for opening up uh, to the possibility of a bridging these alleged emotional interspecies divide. This idea that we can't share the same emotions since we're not the same species. But when we identify emotions in other species, such as joy, pain, or stress, we are often accused of anthropomorphizing, putting our own emotions onto them. But we actually share more experience and emotions with other species than we sometimes care to recognize. We do identify the expressions of pain and joy in the dogs that share our homes, in the cows that finally is let out to the green grass after a long winter enslaved in the factories, and we hear the stress in the voices of the pigs taken to slaughter. We can interpret and identify these emotions, if we choose to. So, anthropomorphism isn't automatically, automatically a bad thing to me. Instead, it could be seen, or it should be seen, as a possibility, if you pair it together with empathy, critical thinking, critical thinking towards oneself and your own human-centered kind of universe. Um, so if we can keep track of this, our human-centered egoism, I'd like to stretch so far to say that we do not anthropomorphize enough. The problem is that we do not anthropomorphize enough, that we instead suffer from what the psychologist, primatologist, and ethologist, ethology means uh, the study of animal behavior. Uh, Franz, Franz de Waal calls anthropodenial meaning a refusal and, and here I quote, a blindness to the human-like characteristics of other animals or the animal-like characteristics of ourselves. Okay, so in my recent artworks, I have embraced what seems to me to be the inevitable human desire for anthropomorphism and my own hopes that anthropomorphism can be a transformative tool in the writing of non-human participation in art history. This has taken the form of writing counter art histories for the painting portraying animals that I research. And it has lately developed into guided tours where the focus is on the imagined experience of the portrayed non-human animals that are hanging portrayed on the museum walls. And when I'm exploring this, I cannot really be afraid of failure. Since I'm human, I, I am doomed. <laughs> I am human-centered. I'm an egoistic person. But I try. Uh, so I need to review my assumptions about these other animals critically. I need to have the courage to really try and to really fail. And I will never be able to fully understand another person, be it human or non-human. But through research, I can try to found, find and dig deep into context and background about these humans, non-humans, and paintings that interact within these often golden frames. 
and making it possible to perhaps experience what a Finnish psychologist named Elisa Altula would call an other-directed, less self-centered empathy. And thereby hoping that my artworks actually can push for a future where the non-human experience of exploitation will come to an end. So now I will give you an example of how these ideas and the writings that I do can take shape and become text-based artworks. Uh, so as I said earlier, we will go to National Museum, but you can sit still. I've organized this for you. Uh, but I need to change some of the digital things. So. Again, I want you to chat with each other. And to me, it would be really interesting if you could just touch upon this. Do you believe that we are in anthropodenial? Are you refusing the idea that, or are you refusing recognizing and acting upon the emotions that you see in other species? Hmm? Yes, anthropodenial, like denying. <laughs> yeah, good question. Denying or like when you recognize an emotion in another species, uh, you can act upon it or you can deny it. And I think we do both all the time. So are we in anthropodenial? Do we actually listen? Because sometimes we recognize and identify, but do we act on or do we really listen? And if it's super confusing, still chat about the confusing parts, and then we can discuss that afterwards. Yeah? Okay. We are going to visit National Museum in Stockholm, and uh, there we're going to talk, take a shorter guided tour. Uh, we are going to National Museum to visit a wild cat, a lion, and a capper kai which in Swedish is shadow. I am a wild cat. I am framed within golden frames, and within those golden frames, I am lying in green grass. It is sunlight and afternoon. I am resting in the shade. This is how I am depicted. This painting doesn't document the before and after it doesn't document the process of art making, the violence in it. I am found on floor six at National Museum in Stockholm in the northwest part of the permanent exhibition called The Countryside. Above me, a killed fox hanging from a tree in a snowy landscape. Below me, a sign telling the visitor, and thereby the world, that the artist Rosa Bonheur is one of the most famous animal painters of her time, and that her interest in other animals was true and genuine. It also informs us that I am an excellent example of her realistic way of portraying animals. An excellent example this means that I must be an excellent teller of the truth. Let me introduce you to Nero.
I am a lion named Nero. I find myself in a courtyard of a chateau with walls that are heavy of animal trophies. The artist lives and works here. I am surrounded by a gazelle, deer, elk, horse, bull, goat, yak, dog, pig, monkey, and birds who cannot fly. The artist has built a great studio of red brick and large windows through which he can study us all. The great gate to the road is opened daily. More animals than people pass. The animals are transported on carts, are tied to donkeys and horses, are imprisoned in wooden boxes. She is collecting us, studying us for her paintings, and when she is done, we disappear through the gate again. But I'd rather disappear through the white gate towards the forest. I imagine that the forest means freedom. I imagine that there are no tools of studying out there. I have seen a painting of myself where I am standing alone in a landscape so vast the horizon is almost invisible. I am looking out into the landscape with my back to the viewer. There is so much longing in me and you have understood and portrayed this longing. You must have felt what I feel to be able to portray me like this. You felt my suffering, but you kept on causing it. You know of our suffering, of the knife that has to pierce our bodies for us to become material. Still, you keep on doing it. I am living in a cage, on a courtyard of a chateau that was once a hunting lodge, and I am going to die in a cage at a zoo next to a natural history museum where animals will be imprisoned, exhibited and experimented on for hundreds of years. Paintings of myself and other animals who have passed the gates of this chateau will be filling the walls of museums all over the world. It keeps on going. I cannot see an end to it. But I am more than material. You talk to me, you mourn me, you treat me differently than the lion next to me. You do that because you know that I have personality. I am an individual and you know this. You feel it, but it doesn't matter. These feelings don't give me freedom. After all, I am still only animal to you. Nero tells a story that I haven't experienced. When I met Rosa, she didn't have a chateau. The cage of Nero was one of metal bars. Mine is one of golden wood. What if we all had resisted? If I had been a bit quicker? If we all had been faster, on the move, refusing to be still? Would she then had been able to study? Would she then had had her success? Would she then have been excellent? When humans transport me, I am held by cotton gloves. No human skin has touched me for several of years. It could be interpreted as care, but I see it as a way to not feel to not care, to not recognize, to not listen. The cotton gloves to me means distance. The cotton gloves are here to stop time, to 
keep me alive forever, to keep me on display. I will soon again be transported from the museum hall and down into the archives. When this happens, I will try to resist. My golden frame will tear the glove this time because it is never too late to start resisting. Follow the wind and you will find me. The icy cold wind whips the royal standard, forcing the soldier carrying the flag to struggle, holding hard with both hands. The wind lifts his coat, hurrying on, almost catching the hat of another soldier before grabbing another's coat. And there I am. In front of the snow falling over the ledge, on the back, of the huntsman, hanging upside down, blood dripping from my beak, leaving a small trace of red in the snow-filled footprint of the human who killed me. Here I am, and I refuse to be red symbolically. I am what Carl Linnaeus defined as Tetra Urugalius. You call me Capricayi, Wood Grouse, or as they say in the province of Jämtland, Schäder, Gråfågel, or Järhane. The name has been given me in relation to other birds in a never-ending organization of all that is living. There are two ways for you to see and read my presence, either as a symbol or as a once living being. I refuse to think of myself as a symbol and therefore urge you to read me as living because once I was alive or once someone was alive for someone else to kill and later study. Humans want other animals to be still so that they can study. So that you can create a perfect watercolor drawing of the back feathers of someone like me. And it takes several. I am not only one. I am a series of me. I am an us. The artist used his brother, colleagues, friends and child to stand as models for some of the painted humans. But to be able to paint us, he had to study one of our kind, hanging upside down. To paint us, we had to be killed. For this painting, we have been given golden medals. We have been hanging at a marble palace in St. Petersburg. We have escaped a revolution, been lost, been rolled and carried, we have been moved by train, car and hands to finally end up in the country of which this painting's nationalistic agenda still serves. But this is no longer a painting where a king is passing by a hunter with a kapokai on his back. This is now painting about a killed Capricayi who is hanging on the back of a hunter when a dead king happens to pass by. The scene is romantic, and it's a romantic glorification of the return of a king. But it is also a factual documentation of us, hanging dead next to the rifle that killed. 
and instead of a romantic nationalist celebration of a dead king, you can choose to see the bird above us in the sky as a celebration of our life, calling out, declaring the death of us over the landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, mm -hmm. for this wonderful presentation, for really opening up, uh, perhaps for me, at least a new way of thinking about anthropomorphism as this sort of imaginative practice that can help us reconnect to the rest of the living world. I just wanted to ask you a very quick follow-up before we set up for our conversation here. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could share some of the, the conversations or the kinds of uh, responses that you got from the public and the audiences that you have experienced this um, um, performance with. Mm -hmm. Did you get any interesting feedback from that? And uh, what kind of groups also? Is it different ages or just a just curiosity of that? Yeah, okay. So uh, the last time I did a performance like this was uh, it was an opening performance at a Kunsthalle in uh, Germany. And uh, there I was uh, called uh, uh, the one coming with a really bad uh, stemming. Like uh, atmosphere. Atmosphere, yeah. I, I was a party pooper, actually. <laughs> it, 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 right. was, it was said with a laugh and uh, some sort of a joy. Uh, right. But I mean, yes, it's my job to be a kind of a killjoy in this, or a vegan killjoy, or an, I don't know, like an ethical killjoy when, when it comes to other animals or so. So I'm used to that. Uh, but um, I mean, there's always been some really interesting discussions afterwards and mm -hmm. people also ask me a lot about the paintings and they ask oh is this true and is this research and yes i don't just imagine things there mm -hmm. I, I i i do all this research and i read about the painting about the history about the situation i go in contact with the museums i read about the animals i read about uh, what it looked like when it happened where was the studio and everything and when i have all these kinds of uh, knowledge and information you can fill the gaps mm -hmm. um, so yes nero was at the zoo next to the natural right. history museum um yeah and all the other things that i say Wonderful. Um, okay, we yeah. can go more into that. I, I'll just ask for one minute of your patience. We, we're just going to put the table a little bit here, and then I'll, I'm going to ask Christine to come back to us, and then we have a conversation from oh, there. Another chit-chat. Yes, <laughs> another <laughs> one. <laughs> so, um, as we were saying in the beginning, uh, in a way, I tend to think about uh, these big challenges that we have, climate change or biodiversity loss, in a way also as an opportunity for humanity to really reassess the ways in which we relate and place ourselves and in, in interact with the rest of the living world. Um, so, as a way to start, and my, if my microphone allows me to, um, I would like to ask actually if you could describe for us uh, what has been your own personal journey in the place and in the development of the practices that you have that so clearly illustrate the ways in which artists are actually entering and creating possibilities of, of interactions and new kinds of relationships with the rest of the living world. So your work illustrates that and I, w I wanted to ask you if you could uh, help us understand your trajectory. What, what, what has been important moments that actually open up for you uh, that said, I need to be listening to the plants in a different way or I need to be working with, with the ways in which we relate to animals? So could you tell us a little bit about your own personal trajectory on that? For me, it's not <laughs> anthropomorphism. I think uh, it's really interesting to confront other life forms uh, 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 without me projecting myself. Uh, that's really fascinating. And also, uh, it has to do with my frustration. Um, 
w what can I do to to do something good in this world? See? Could you describe to us the... This is a, is a atom bomb. That's an atom bomb? Yeah. Th ah. This is me. Okay. What, what can I do <laughs> to do something good? I have an allotment garden uh, where... I I think there's some <laughs> where I try to um, uh, grow my own plant pigments. I've I've started with the uh, wormwood uh, that I paint with, and this is a start. I dig where I where I stand, and I can do something good uh, for pollinators, for plants in this little square garden. There, I can control me as a human uh, and as an artist but yeah um, was there a particular moment in uh, th through your life that you actually realized that you you wanted to have a, a conversation larger than just with humans um, I I, uh, I did my ground tour in South America mm -hmm. and um, always been interested in in nature and ha have had this contact this contact. But there, uh, in, uh, in a small village in Costa Rica, uh, I, I stayed there for, for a very long time. And there I really had these uh, meetings with, with nature mm -hmm. that, uh, th that I'm dealing with still. Wow. Mm. What about yourself, Marie? Well, uh, it's not working. Is it? Yes, it is. Yes. It is? Yes, it is. It is? Yes. No? Sometimes. Yes. Sometimes? Sometimes. Okay. That's weird. I found that, that it also if I feels hold it I'm ha standing with my back towards you, so I'm just gonna do like this. <laughs> feels more as if I'm talking to all of you. More balanced. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so the question, yeah, if there was like a specific moment in mm -hmm. time that made my art take a turn or whatever. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I had an epiphany once. Uh, it's um, ten years ago now, I think. Uh, I adopted a dog, and her name was Della, and it's a bit emotional because she just died, so it's really, yeah. Okay, so we had this really strong bond, and meeting her made me understand that I don't know anything about other animals. I, have this, I had this idea that mm. I, I knew things that I of course, they didn't know because I was completely like taken aback um, by the way that we could share love and communication and the way I could understand her and the way that she could communicate with me. So I just had to like understand that I knew nothing about other animals, meaning I know nothing about cows. I know nothing about pigs. I know nothing about any insect at all. I know nothing. So I need to start from scratch. And by knowing nothing, how can I then use this kind of power that I have in my life by actually killing others to eat them or using their bodies as, as materials? So it was like this epiphany or this situation where she came into my life uh, made me rethink the whole system of myself and my mm. art production. Mm. Fascinating. I think, uh, I mean, th both of the presentations, they really illustrate that there are so many ways and paths f for opening up these more than human conversations. And uh, my curiosity here in terms, perhaps we could go a bit further into what other methods do, do we know that exist out there? Because this idea of anthropomorphism or the idea that humans are are on top of nature, that we have this idea of command and control. It's so deeply uh, entwined with our current culture, especially the Western culture, and it permeates all the way to our policies and the way we, we structure our societies. So what are the methods in which we start questioning that position of the human existence? And I think both of your works do that uh, really well, and it demonstrates how the art is this site of experimenting with new kinds of relationships. And you use very different ones, approaches. You use a more imaginative, performative approach, um, and, and you use more sound 
around and listening and paying attention to what is already happening with plants. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you could tell me a little bit more about that journey of, of the way in which you develop your practice around that. Mm, um yeah, uh, so I, I was studying uh, electroacoustic music and I, uh, I was, um, um, I found all these experiments with plants and music. Mm. And uh, for example, a woman called uh, Dorothy Retalak in the 70s, she did this pseudo scientific experiments with the plants. Uh, shall I? explain sure. yeah, um, uh, so she tried different genres of music uh, and where she exposed right. the plants with uh, pop music with classical music country etc etc and she um, uh, she uh, she uh, exposed the plants for music and then she analyzed uh, the the roots and how, how it had developed and she um, she tried uh, Indian sitar music for some plants, mm. and they really loved it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and then she tried uh, acid rock, she called it, but uh, Led Zeppelin. Uh, and uh, and these plants didn't like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, there, uh, it was really interesting. But in the end, uh, her conclusions were that uh, what is bad for plants is also bad for humans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, but that got me interested and, and I, uh, I clearly, um, we all know that uh, plants uh, like when we talk to them, what is it? And this has been known forever, uh, but I wanted to see uh, what the science says. Right. And, uh, yeah, it says a lot. Right, they right. can communicate with, with uh, their own sounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh. Did you have any comments on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first, uh, this uh, hierarchy that you mm -hmm. explained, there is a specific word for that. And it was important for me. Um, for me, it's always really important to get kind of like words to the things that you discuss or try to or start to feel. Uh, so there is this word, it's sociosuological scale. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it's, a ver it's a word for a vertical scale where different species are put in these hierarchies, humans often on top. Uh, in our society here, uh, for example, pigs are really far down as well as cows and dogs and cats are pretty far up. Yeah. It's a hierarchy of kind of a, uh, yeah, power or how much their life is worth or what you can do to them, actually. Uh, but in other countries, for example, the cow is really important. It's high up in the hierarchy and some humans might be lower in the hierarchy. So that kind of vertical hierarchy is uh, called the sociological scale. And all these species move around in this scale, in this hierarchy, depending on where you're based on the planet or which culture you belong to. And that really, for me, puts the finger on that this is like a cultural uh, uh, kind of uh, a practice, this oppressing practice, and that it can be changed, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, that was like a key concept that was really important to um, find. Right. Now I don't really remember your well, question. Well, just in, in terms of uh, how, <laughs> how do you gravitate, how did you gravitate towards anthropomorphism as a, mm. as a method mm. to open up these conversations with the more than human world? Uh, I think it was uh, about the fact that uh, uh, I feel that I recognize fear, for example, and I think all of you do. If you went to a, a slaughterhouse and watched the pigs, you would recognize their fear. Uh, but we decide not to act upon it. So for me, I, get, I was interested in anthropomorphism as a way to kind of spark change or how to uh, connect a critical anthropomorphism, some, some call it, uh, to how to connect that to an empathy that like starts a change, mm -hmm. that creates a reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. I, w- I would like to dwell a little bit because I think you you're just coming in here with a point. I would wanted to ask you a little bit about the limits, maybe the boundaries that you might be finding as mm. you develop your practice. So if we start with the anthropomorphism, I think you already mentioned that there's uh, perhaps sometimes a, an issue with uh, overemphasizing our own perspective and yes. our own sensibilities. And I was al- also wondering whether there's a limit in terms of uh, falling only towards more charismatic species, mm-hmm. say the lions, the pigs, mm-hmm. the dogs, yes, and yes. kind of forgetting, you know, shall we be yep. uh, empathetic to coronavirus, for mm. instance, yeah. and, and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, the classical problem with what we call the mega fauna, mm-hmm. that you tend to be more interested in like exotic animals or beautiful animals or animals that kind of can uh, mimic your own uh, facial expressions. And that is uh, definitely a problem that I have, because to me, it is very difficult for me to imagine these other realities or these other histories if I can't really connect. And to be able to connect, I need to have some kind of, to understand fear or uh, Mm -hmm. to understand the situation or a, a specific environment that they move within or their way of communicating or uh, so, uh, for example, it would be it is I have tried, but it is extremely difficult for me to imagine an, a f- a f- from the perspective of a painting that is completely abstract, but the title is giraffe drinking, for example. I mean, it, it's just completely I can't I, there's no no way for me to get into that. Yeah. So yes, there are like difficulties and I just need to or I am choosing the ones that I somehow can relate to. Mm. Because otherwise, it's just impossible for me. I'm sorry, you had a comment. No, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, decisions to be made because if you sympathize with all the animals and all the plants and all the people and everything, you, you get this tiredness and, and you can't connect with anything. Mm. Uh, it's more like uh, you have to just uh, ch- there's something else I, f- I find that ha- needs to be changed that uh, th- ha- to look at yourself in a different way um, uh, and that's the big uh, that's hard mm. uh, to to put yourself in in, in um, in a level with with everything else, but I think uh, to to uh, connect with everything is just impossible. Mm. You just have to disconnect yourself or something. Mm. I don't know. And and to do a j- little bit of a jump, but go towards maybe t- uh, your practice, also understanding a little bit of the limitations. I was you mentioned that you you work also with sort of fragments of of new age and mysticism or or metaphysics, and I was just wondering whether you find resistance, and especially because you uh, it seems like you are in conversation with scientists who perhaps see those ideas as a bit more out there and so w- th- th- have you encountered difficulties there or what is well that's and, and why do you choose to to work with those kind yeah. of instances? that's the beauty of being an artist that <laughs> that this is the perfect tool you can go in and out in all these worlds right. mm-hmm. and no one can question your <laughs> your <laughs> your ideas uh, and and um, yeah and I think that is inspiring both for scientists and and that's why uh, and also um, people on the other side of, of this, this spectra. Uh, they're so divided, we need to go in and out and, uh, and change perspectives and, and uh, s- try to see it from, from many, uh, in, in many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to uh, one day is uh, look, be looking at, at facts and n- the next day have a, a true experience of having some kind of connection with the, with a plant mm-hmm. and that is as true as the, the this facts that I can uh, read and and yeah as an artist I can uh, I can assure you that this is no problem uh, this is this is something we could try the third way. 
exactly. I think this is a really interesting illustration of how art play a really central role in, the, in these days in order to actually really connect these different ways of knowing the world. So I wonder if both of you could do a little bit of a reflection of, of your experience in actually moving through these spaces and, and how that has played out for you. How is it to work with these multiple ways of, of knowing and knowledge systems? Well, um, as I said, uh, it's uh, for me it's a kind of uh, Alkunstwerk or, or uh, synesthetical uh, method uh, to to let an, um, uh, something uh, enter your your one sense and then uh, leave you in another way mm -hmm. through. Um, um sound or or image or this is the way i i see the world too i mean uh one fact can transform and transmute and and become something else it doesn't mean it has to be politics but it, it is a good way of of uh be um uh T to be ready to to see the world in in a different way mm -hmm. um, maybe you can <laughs> <laughs> how so has it been for you because you 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 do your practice now is between a, a science department and an artistic mm. practice so mm. how, how is that process mm, well it's wonderful i would say i mean critical animal studies is uh ah oh, what is that word in english when you it's a field which you gather all different kinds of fields within a field. Sort of an integrative area of study. <laughs> Interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary. Thank you. The word. <laughs> the word. <laughs> okay, so critical animal uh, studies is interdisciplinary. So, and everyone seems to be really curious in each other. So, uh, within that field, I just feel that there is this. Uh, since we all also have like a common goal, even though we go towards that goal in different shapes and forms. Uh, but I think to me, it's more been a problem with dealing with the art world actually. And I think it's really, it's difficult to talk about an art world. There are several different kinds of art worlds, uh, different layers in this wonderful cake of art. Um, but I mean, also being an activist and trying to talk about these difficult subjects and uh, violence and all of that. Um, sometimes I feel as I feel really like nervous for coming to a place like this and talk about violence, but not nervous when I go to a university or uh, or go to a, a conference, an academic conference. Um, but to me, I would. Like I think that the art world needs to step up its game a bit. We what do you mean, nervous to come here? Why? No, but it's Why more about like talking about violence and talking about veganism, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, I think it's it can be difficult to be doing that in this this art context, actually. But I don't know if that is a fact or if that is a feeling, or if the feeling is a fact. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, but. I mean, I would love for the art world to step up its game and talk more clearly about the violence going on uh, when it comes to other animals. Uh, I think that is done sometimes and then not so much. And also there is this buzzword of this interlinked uh, sharing, developing art together. But me as a critical person coming from critical animal studies, being vegan, trying to erase this kind of uh, power relation and oppressive system. Uh, when I look at a lot of art telling uh, that we are doing this in collaboration with other animals, I would say that they not mostly, there is no collaboration. There is just a human using other animals as material. And and do you mean uh, as artistic material, yeah. like yeah. Wh what you paint with or what you... Yeah, are both dead animals within material, but mm -hmm. also living animals. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to uh, uh, Liverpool to uh, perform a sort of a response on an art piece where there are ants within it. and Living ants. It's living ants, mm -hmm. yes. And it is uh, said to be a collaboration, but I would say it's not. It's just it's like, it's just a cage. Mm. But yeah. it's just a cage. 
It's ja. an artwork shaped as a cage, but it's ants. Okay. And ants, we are really bad at like reading ants agency and ants <laughs> can't really uh, show their resistance to us. That It's not that clear to us, so it's easier to say that it's a collaboration, I think, mm. than if it would have been like a couple of dogs in a gallery. Okay, I, I have a... Uh, yeah. I have a, a, f a flower pot yeah. in my studio, mm. um, and uh, the stinging nettle mm. uh, sadly died. Mm. Uh, but uh, the pot is still there, and I put my microscope in in this pot, and wow, it was a whole universe there mm. of living things. Mm. I, d I had no idea. Mm. I start um, uh, photographing this. Uh, a time-lapse film, and I uh, started to feed this flower pot with organic waste. Uh, when I clear, clean my studio, I put an orange peel or whatever in, in this pot, and it was <laughs> it is the little society there is growing. Hmm. And uh, what am I? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Are they? I don't know. And they they are in is this small and and they are living there and in my in how I presented this film was like they are working in their world mm. uh, towards the same goal as me. Mm. Uh, I'm working in the studio parallel to them, um, and uh, yeah. Well <laughs> I don't know. Would you call it a collaboration? <laughs> I don't know if I have, but uh, I could. Uh, okay. Well, we are working on the same artwork, mm. Mm. Uh, so some <laughs> kind of uh, collaboration mm. it is. Mm. But if they are prisoners, mm. or, or they, I didn't know they were there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the difference. Though. <laughs> so it's the intention. Yeah, it's the intention that yeah. counts. Mm. But I'm not sure. No. I'm trying to figure this out myself. Mm. Yeah, mm. and uh, I mean, it's really. It's easier for me to critique a work with dogs, cat, uh, I don't know, whatever animals, giraffes, than critiquing work with uh, insects, for example, mm -hmm. because I don't have uh, that much empathy with insects yet. I hope that I will get there, but I'm not there. Mm -hmm. this so is, I don't yeah. know, actually. Watch. <laughs> no, it's, it's a fascinating. Let's meet in a year and discuss the work. <laughs> it's a fascinating question because I think that what well, and and in, indeed it is not a question that has an answer. It's a question that it's about a sensibility that is developing and constantly developing. Uh, like you said, maybe you're more sensitive to some aspects than others, right? But I think I agree with Joanna Macy saying that we are actually in a period of a great transition where we are waking up to a planet that is alive and is not inert out there, right? And and we are becoming aware and more and more about the, the multiple forms of, uh, of life, right? And like you say, mul multiple forms of intelligence. So what happens when you actually know that there's multiple kinds of intelligences there? Can we become too sensitive? Mm. No? Uh, we, uh, we need to know our place in the world, of course, mm. but uh, uh, just knowing that there is so many things going on around us, signals, uh, uh, conversations that we have no idea of is uh, is making you a bit humble, right. and and mm. that is important. And and yeah, I mean sensitivity is uh, starts within you, when I guess in relation to other species or living beings, uh, this sensitivity starts within you when you question your own position within this hierarchy when you question power relations so mm -hmm. no I don't think we can be too sensitive right and the, f the feeling I think I relate very much when I saw your piece outside as well Christina I think it's that feeling that there's a communication going on more than what is being said it's like there's something that is being said someone and is that trying and that yeah. feeling it's 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 amazing really mm. it, it is a humbling uh, perspective which I think is we really need it with in times of scientific uh, rubrics and so on. So uh, this is really wonderful and I think I'd, I'm just re really curious about the kinds of questions you might have out there. So if you have any questions that we can take from here, here's one. We have a microphone and do feel free to, to join in. So 
one thing I was thinking with the ants was like, oh, they can, I think, tell you that they, when you interfere or so, that they don't mm. like you to be there because they can sting you, right? Yeah, yeah. So that would be a sign. Yeah. But, okay, that was just a thought. But then I was really curious about you too. Uh, you are like, uh, you should not use the resources and everything like from the animals and as an artist, etc. And you were like about plants, but then we eat, you are like vegan, you eat plants. Mm. And you were like, hey, we should consider the mm. plants the same way as we, should, as we see animals. So what should we eat? Or how do you think about it? Or should we ask them if we can eat them? Or, because, or, or how do you feel yeah. about them? And you yeah, have like to wait until they say yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, then you can eat that. Yeah. No, um, uh, um, I will answer that. Uh, there was uh, a scientist um, that uh, said that um, something happened uh, uh, in the evolution when plants uh, started to to do their things and and animals started to develop. We separate. You disappeared. Yeah, maybe the battery went. Something happened. Maybe we could use the oh, microphone. Yep. Ah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, something happened during the the evolution, uh, and uh, um, animals and humans uh, didn't uh, isn't constructed that well. We have one brain placed in one place. And, but um, plants, they are like colonies. They have their intelligence spread everywhere and down in the root system. And if, you, if you divide a plant in two halves, it can live uh, perfectly uh, like two individuals. But if you uh, uh, divide a, a human in two, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. so, so plants are the ones really smart. And uh, their strategy is for us to actually eat them and to, to spread. So that's their uh, strategy. Is, uh, we are just, they want to share. They want to share. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. um, yeah. But if you do care about plants, you shouldn't eat animals, since a lot of plants uh, go through the bodies of animals before humans eat them. So if you're interested in that kind of topics or discussions, then I would say go vegan. Mm -hmm. There's a question here in the back. I'm just going to go with the microphone. There you go. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a more general question, uh, since we're talking about the ideas of anthropomorphism. Uh, is it a collaboration with the animals or not, and so on and so forth. So my question has more to do with the fact that we are aware of other ways of living in the world, right? We all, it has come up in other sessions here in these uh, programs, in this exhibition, indigenous cultures and the way how they relate to the world and to the plants and to the animals and so on and so forth. So my question has to do with the fact, are we maybe a little bit trapped by and in the language? So that we are fighting with these uh, notions of anthropomorphism or collaboration. It's our language. It's uh, and and it's the language that we de have developed and with which we communicate now. It's not the origins of the language that is much more rooted, uh, closer to the plants, to the landscape, and to the living world. We have moved away from that and we have come here. And now we try to go back there, but use this language and. The language is supposed to be the thing that makes us special as species, but has it become the barrier? Mm. So that's my question. Mm. Very good. Question. Uh, Do we have I think you're language? onto something. Uh, that uh, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, since we trust so much in the words that we speak, uh, it seems to me that that affects how we read body language, uh, facial expressions, uh, other kinds of agencies and communication forms. Um, so that we, even though we recognize fear, for example, 
or we identify fear, uh, we don't really trust our notion of knowing that it is fear, uh, because we have this idea that agency needs to be spoken. Uh, so yeah, I think we are trapped uh, within a system based on this kind of idea of power on the human being on top. Um, yeah. Building building on that question, I, w I wanted to ask you, I had a question before, Christine, about the, the ways in which, through your practice, you shift the register going from smell to sound. And I wonder if that relates to this idea of sort of overcoming some of the barriers of language and, and trying to tap into these other sensorial approaches to listen to what is being said. If you could tell us a little bit about that, why do you shift between different registers? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think you have uh, you're 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 right there. Uh, it's uh, um, we have a problem with with the language, and we need to be uh, learn uh, some more um, languages like plant language. The difficulties is uh, our senses, our noses aren't that good, um, but sometimes if you really if you really work on it, I think uh, I think I can have some kind of chemical um, conversation with my plants, um, uh, and I'm sure they are scanning me. Uh, and and if I could ask them, uh, they would tell me my uh, chemical status, and uh, I think that will happen. And, and that's when I think. Uh, this problem with language uh, maybe uh, will disappear when, when we actually can have this conversation with plants, for example. Um, we can interview them and, and uh, uh, we can decode their, their, uh, their language. Uh, but to have this two-way communication, uh, we're not really there yet, but... Uh, when we are, I think, yeah, what will happen? Mm -hmm. mm. Great. We have another question back here. Thanks. When you say we are not there, uh, do you think there is some people that is there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think. I, uh, uh, for example, know oh. people that have uh, <laughs> uh, 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 extremely uh, good. Um, uh, do you say smell or scent or uh, mm? noses? Uh, and uh, uh, like myself, for example. And um, yeah, I, um, I think uh, the uh, the world of a, of a dog, mm. all this information uh, smelling around. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, and I know um, that uh, some people are really s uh, good at knowing things that uh, others doesn't because because of their heightened senses. Uh, I just wanted to add to that question, or I understood your question as maybe being about if there are people in other parts of this world that maybe doesn't have the same problem with language and the same problem with this hierarchy that we've been talking about. And of course there are. Sure. Um, so that's how I understood the question over mm. there. I can think of the word while the microphone comes. The, the, this uh, conversation is from our perspective, of course. Mm -hmm. So I think there are. S I just wanted to know if you, when you say we, what that is, <laughs> yeah. is in, because that's what we're talking about. Yeah, so we. So we. In, in general, we. Yeah. But yeah. I think there but are some exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are people that maybe live in a different environment and. Uh, and so they are not included in it's we or yeah no no exactly <laughs> they don't have a problem with this uh, mm. yeah they are they are they have this communication open mm -hmm. 
There's a question in the back here. <laughs> here we go. Thank you. Hi. My name is Tove. I work as a gardener. And mm. I find this very, very interesting, this mm. topic. Um, I was thinking about time when you have to listen to the plants because I, use, I work in the same garden year after year and I find time is the key to really hear what the plants are talking about. Yeah. So have you sensed that when you're doing all your studies and stuff like that, that time is, is an issue yeah, that we living people don't have? We don't give ourselves time to listen to the nature because they are talking to us all the time. Mm -hmm. They're talking, talking, talking. And I find it fascinating because I can actually hear them now after years in the same garden. They are actually talking to me, telling me what to do and not to do. So time, I think time is an issue in this modern society for mm -hmm. us to understand plants and the growth of them and what they need and what we need from them. Yeah, and, yeah. and more uh, absolutely time is the, the key and that's the difficult uh, part uh, of this communication because they are living on a completely different timeline yeah. than I am and we could, I mean, they, when you time-lapse uh, um, uh, f uh, photograph um, plants, uh, you see they are moving around and then it doesn't have to do with the sun or, or anything like that. They are just moving, like almost like dancing. Oh. Uh, and uh, if they are dancing or not, I don't know, but <laughs> I could... If if I was in the same timeline as them, I could we could really dance together, like the tr with the trees. And but that that's the hard part. I we have to slow down. Oh yeah. yo, yo. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> we have to slow down. Oh yo, yo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Mm. Further questions, comments, questions. <laughs> Anything in between. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maria. I work as a teacher with aesthetic, uh, how do you say, aesthetic learning processes. Um, and I'm totally nerdy about children's play. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see similarities in what you, you two are looking for and researching through art, I do the same, but I do it through play. And there are connections. And uh, after years studying, studying play very closely, not only with children, also with adults, I see that in play, we do this already. Do uh, what? Um, communicate. Uh, yeah. with with other life forms mm -hmm. so um, beside time I think we also need play because play is natural for us uh, as, yeah. as a way of meeting our surrounding and, and understanding the surroundings and I see children talking to plants and animals all the time, and they get answers. They also live in another timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I... Through play. Yeah. So that's, that's just another winkel <laughs> angle <laughs> of, of what we're speaking about. Yeah, for, for me, I have uh, uh, easier to connect with animals that like to play mm. or have humor. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is really fascinating. Thank you for your question. I also wanted to mention if anybody wants to make a, a question or in Swedish, please feel free. Uh, there are many translators here. Do you have a question? No? Just a comment. Yeah. Play around. Art as a yeah. That's why we need art. Right. Yes. yes. We need you to, to make this interdisciplinary research. 
Yeah, I think so. It's, and <laughs> on this planet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Here we go. You said some plants have more humor than others. Oh, did I? Uh, yeah. <laughs> are there any specific plants that have more humor and others who are more serious? <laughs> or, or, and also about the personality, are all, let's say, uh, nestlor, are they similar or to each other? The nestles, are yeah. they similar to each other or are they also different, different plants? Uh, do they uh, 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 help their, their yeah, own yeah, kind yeah. or or? I mean, I can say it. Oh ah, yeah, absolutely. Om brännslor yeah. har om du tar olika brännslerplanter har de olika slags personligt eller liknar de varandra? Är de mer lika i en grupp än en annan helt annan växt? Uh, English or Swedish? Um, uh, As you like. Ja, yeah, okay. Eh, nej men de skiljer sig ju alla växter eh, men eh, de verkar samarbeta mer ju, ju närmare rent eh, släktmässigt de är eh, och ibland så är det eh, nu säger jag fel för ibland är det tvärtom att de hjälper liksom andra sorter eh, för att få ett mer Uh, maybe I take this in or not. Uh, alltså man har gjort uh, um, tester med monokulturer som inte är något bra för att uh, där kan man uh, se att växterna inte liksom har någon motståndskraft och de, 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 uh, de behöver liksom andra sorter, andra typer av växter som kan liksom hjälpa dem kemiskt och, och kanske skicka över någon, någon kemisk... Uh, medicin för att någon är angripen av något speciellt mögel eller, eller någon, någon insekt eller någonting sånt där. Och att, att den här blandningen av växter faktiskt gör att, att de är tåligare helt enkelt. Nu spår jag ur lite för det handlade ju om om de hade humor. Eller vad sa du? Om de var personliga. Om de var personliga. Men de Yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering because we all contain like plants have a lot of water. We have a lot of water like in our bodies and of course animals as well. And then so how should how should we place water in this whole um, hierarchy or whatever? Because water is like because because I thought about this or connected this to each other because you said how the plants were reacting on the music and then you know. Um, Mr. Emoto from Japan or so, like who did all the research about uh, water and how water responds to kind of mu yeah to music, all kinds of music. And because your 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 person said like um, what is bad for the plants is maybe also bad for us. Yeah. So he's he's also about that. Yeah. So I thought mm. like yeah. So what about water? Because yeah, water is also maybe an organism or whatever, like something mm. that we, yeah. Mm. But I think uh, the danger here is to to always see the world through through our human uh, mm -hmm. uh, perspective. Uh, I mean, who knows what water is thinking, uh -huh. uh, and uh, that water should uh, respond to my uh, uh, to my feelings. I don't know, and mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but the most important, I think, is that we we don't know. Mm. And we must just accept that there are things that we just don't know. Mm. And we need to nourish and, and take care of, of water and plants, even though we can't truly, really understand them. Mm. Mm. There is a place in, um, I think it's like in America, where they gave right to a river. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Would you like? Yes. Rights and also personhood is being granted all over now also towards other species. Mm -hmm. That they are granted personhood, which means that they have the right to decide of their own life and uh, refuse imprisonment, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, just, this is not really a question, but more a reflection that uh, the fact that we are gathered here today to 
think and talk about how we can understand other animals better or plants better and maybe even communicate with them or and to respect other life forms uh, is the reason why we are more and more people that are interested in these topics is also because we realize that we have destroyed the nature that we're part of and that uh, to the point that we might not survive ourselves. There are of course um, peoples that have uh, cultivated this knowledge of that we are part of nature and uh, managed to do so uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, but the majority of us have forgotten that, and um, but we are afraid now, and we have to rethink. And um, yeah, the positive side of that, I guess, is that we are more and more that are really getting interested in finding new doors uh, that can help us to think of a new way, realizing that these systems of knowledge and traditions of ideas have been really hurtful and abusive, not only to other life forms, but also to ourselves as human beings. Um, can I just comment? Sure. Mm -hmm. Just a comment on that. I'm also really happy that this topic now is almost like a buzz around it. Uh, it also scares me a bit um, because I'm hoping for well, this thinking in new ways. Uh, I'm hoping that this will spark like a practice or change, a practice of change, where we start to question these ideas we have of power relations. Uh, not that we come up with new ideas of oppression that doesn't hurt the planet. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like it's the questioning the idea of oppression and the system of oppression is key not how to do it differently. Um, yes. Mm. Excellent. <clears throat> Is there anybody else who would like to? Yeah, there's a comment here, a question. Uh, hello. Uh, I think it's a mix between uh, okay. a comment and a question. Uh, I'm thinking about the nettle not being an exotic plant, uh, uh, but it was uprooted and put into a studio. Uh, did you find that the plant had any reaction to the actual moving from outside? No, I inside? grew it from, from seeds. So they from didn't seeds. know okay. uh, uh, about okay. outside. Okay. They just <laughs> thought, oh, you are my world. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I put them outdoors when they grew, they grew so tall. And they were living year after year in our compost uh, out in, in the yard outside, outside my house. Mm. Mm -hmm. Happy, I think. <laughs> I hope. Great. Well, if there are no further questions or comments, I think I just would like again to thank the Moderna Museum for organizing, bringing us all together. Thank you all for coming. And thanks, Christine and Marie, for this wonderful thank insights you. and for sharing your practice with us. I think it's been a really insightful conversation, really led us to uh, great ideas about methods and ways in which we can listen and, and connect to the best of the living world. So again, thank you so much for, for everything. And the cafe will be open so we can continue out there with the drink. Thank you. Thank you.